course, the one work, which is a photographer preferred for Sweden, Mr. Duman, the other one. And I would ask Duman to give you a rundown of the pictures that you see displayed in the room. Then I have Sarah Larsson from our Chamber of Commerce in Emilia. She is the general manager and she is together with the consulate and 14 Swedish companies running um, a pilot project in Luna, which she will talk to you about. But let me just explain why the consulate uh, general decided to bring this exhibition. Uh, as you probably know, Sweden has a feminist government. That means we have 50-50 in terms of ministers. We just recently got the new government, again 50-50. Uh, but we are also supposed to push for gender equality in our foreign policy. And I have now spent three years in India, and I have noticed that India, unfortunately, stands out internationally. Uh, the average uh, participation of women in the labor force is actually increasing worldwide. Uh, average right now is 54 percent. Sweden has 85. Uh, China has 63. India has gone from 42 in 1990 to 25 in 2018. So, of course, we are wondering why. What has happened? And that's why we will today have a panel on unlocking the keys to gender equality. And we believe that the portraits that Yuan has taken of men taking parental leave, thus freeing the woman to be able to take up a job, is part of this equation. We have, so I also asked uh, an Indian photographer to display how the fathers relate to their children here in India. And you see those pictures on the right here. It's Abhinash Mubadu Mubadu who has been kind enough to give us to take these portraits. Uh, and you will see that there is a slight difference in the relationship. But you see also the universality of family and that all parents want to relate to their children. The question is just how far they go and how we create an enabling environment. I'm going to let Yuan explain to you how he came up with this idea. And I should also tell you that this exhibition is now, has now been shown in 80 countries around the world. Uh, and we have had an enormous positive response. It has generated debate in all the countries where it has been. Everything from definition of masculinity to what is exactly the worth and the role of the woman if you have a shared responsibility for the children. Uh, so it opens up for a cultural discussion. I think around social norms but also around what kind of contribution you can get in economical terms if you have women participating in the economic life of the country and not just staying at home. But let's have Yvonne explain why you came up with these pictures, what triggered the idea, and um, yeah, what would you like to add? Thank you for those support. Um, Thank you, Dan, and the Kalagoda to make this possible to see my pictures here in this beautiful place. Um, I'm a Swedish photographer, so we can tell a bit old, and I'm uh, based in the southern part of Sweden. I'm also a father of two sons, who is now seven and three, and it actually started the project when I was home for the first time on parental leave myself, and it was a self-portrait, which is over there on displayed on the wall. Uh, with me and my son. And uh, back then, I started to think and trying to understand how to become a good parent and to become a good father. And I realized that all the pictures I was shown and exposed for was kind of commercialized uh, and 
was hard to find role models that I could relate to. So in that sense, I wanted to create role models that I could relate to. Because it's not about um, superheroes, it's um, role models that I and you hopefully also can relate to. Because it is an international situation in a way, because about uh, raising up children is almost the same. Even though this is in Sweden, uh, the scenario and the situation is the same. About feeding, eating, sleeping, that, all those kinds of natural things that comes. And therefore, I want you to start a debate, not in terms of seeing this as super bad, but more of a debate of why we see this so special. Because this is something that women do or have done for decades and never been recognized on. And that is something that I want to highlight. And um, as I said, I'm a documentary, so a photographer, so I was a part of their life for uh, sometimes weeks and sometimes days. And the exhibition is about um, how about the, the masculinity and how we see a punk man. Because I think the way how to come to an equal society is a difficult path and really you know, complex. It's one sense is that you need to change how to have a good system. And Sweden's the Swedish system is uh, parental insurance system. It's 480 days in total. Uh, and 80% paid by the government. And 90 of these days are bound to the second partner, in this case, father. And you can be flexed during eight, the first eight years of the children's life to take all, all these days. So I have been saving quite much days, which I can use later on as well. And uh, these days, the dads was six months at home, on their own, um, or more. And to be honest, that's a small percentage of the dads in Sweden. And it's actually only 14% that share the days completely equal. And uh, it's 25% is taking out those 90 days which is bound. Because otherwise, the family will lose a lot of money uh, by going back to work. And this is about pay gap, but also the masculinity and also women that has to let go of the responsibility at home and then on pay work and leave it to the father. Because that's one of the reasons as well that uh, women consider themselves better than men in this role. And uh, I will be here if you want to have further questions as well. And I'm, I'm up for interviews and everything, so let me know. In connection with their normal vacation, so instead of having one month vacation, they have two months vacation. Uh, so I think the shift to three months has really put the emphasis on really making it a responsibility. Uh, but as you know, India has gone from 12 weeks to 26 weeks, but there is no government subsidies to the to the maternity leave, uh, which I think is one of the problems, um, how to move on this issue. But another aspect of this has to do, of course, with safety and security of women, both from going, both at home, but going from home to work, from work to home, and in the workplace. So Elsa, yeah, so this is where you come in with your Red Dot. My name is Elsa Marie Vistelma. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Dot Foundation. I'm also an alumni of the Swedish Institute, and my organization is actually a result of that program. So I'm really grateful and thankful uh, to the Swedish Institute, to the Council of General, um, and for giving me this uh, opportunity to contribute towards a very important social cause. I chose to work on the issue of sexual violence prevention and we do it through a crowd map. So we crowdsource data, we encourage women and anyone who's experienced sexual violence to anonymize.
anonymously share their personal stories. And these are then plotted on a map and visually represented so that you can look at trends and patterns that are location based and look for solutions that are location based. It's a different way of looking at the problem. But when I started to understand the basis of this issue, it really boils down to how women are perceived. Because sexual violence, one, doesn't occur in isolation. There's no black and white, it's a lot of gray. And it's really a power dynamic where the most vulnerable is the one who is the victim of this abuse. If you look at these pictures where fathers are participating in this family care, they are really respecting their child, be it a male child or a female child. But in India, unfortunately, the status of women has always been very low. That is reflected one in our birth rates. I don't know if you recently read, but uh, the latest statistic is some of the states have gone down to 805. So 805 girl babies are being born to 1,000 male babies. That is a fundamental systemic problem because you are going to have a shortage of women. Currently we have, I think, 12, 36 million or 27 million extra men. That is a million. The population of Sweden is only 9 million. 10 million. <laughs> so it's almost three times the population of Sweden that we have extra men. Now think about that in practical and realistic terms. If you are on the street and all you can see is, you know, our men, especially at 8 at night or in an isolated spot, how are you as a woman going to feel? We are very privileged and lucky to be here in Bombay, you know. But think about other cities. Think about if you've traveled to Delhi or any other city which doesn't have such a robust transportation system like Bombay. And it's not to say that Bombay is super safe. We are relatively better off than other cities in India. But on a daily basis, either we are victims of violence, and most of this violence actually happens in the home. But we work on public space violence, so I can talk more about that aspect. So when you look at what do you face, you know, in the transportation, are you really comfortable there if that is your commute? Or if you're going to be harassed on a daily basis? Our data and our audits show that in Bombay, the majority of the instances take place along the railway lines. And when we spoke to about a thousand people, less than 2% had even reported their own instances of sexual violence. If we don't report and document our experiences, we have nothing to work on. And as a result, the system also is slow to respond where if there's no statistics, the police are not really um, pushed to increase security, the railway authorities or any other authorities are not doing their bit, and the bystanders also don't are not encouraged to respond. So it's a systemic issue. On my part, I will I don't want to talk so much about it because we have a panel discussion at two o'clock, which I would encourage you to come to. But really my motivation to bring this exhibition in partnership with the Consulate General of Sweden in Mumbai was because I believe the role of men in family care is very critical. One is it, it promotes the well-being of the family as a whole. It builds the trust bond between the children and the father. It uh, provides role models for the children because their parents, they can see not just their mother doing all the work at home but also their father. And the gender stereotypes are unconscious biases which are affected, start breaking down. And then lastly, it really uh, helps the women go out and get that job. Today in India, we have the largest number of women graduates ever, but the lowest in the workforce. And the reason, there are two reasons for it. One is the role of men in family care. Second is the perception of safety. So under the guise of safety, many families say stay at home, you don't need to earn, earn a living. But earning a living is important for a woman because it gives her financial independence and therefore act, uh, <coughs> options for opportunities to make the best decisions for herself and her family. But if men take, take on their role equally in the family, it actually helps women contribute to the economy. There's a vacancy study that says that if true gender equality is achieved by 2025, India can add 770 billion dollars. I don't know how many zeros there are. 770 billion dollars. 
dollars to the Indian economy. Think about that. We would be much more prosperous. But for that, we need men to contribute. And I happened to see this exhibition last year at the Stockholm Gender Equality Forum, which I was fortunate to attend as an alumni in April. And I'm really glad that within a year we had a, a like-minded partner, Nuruka, and her team, and we were able to bring it here. So I would encourage you to look at these pictures and enjoy, and do come back at 2 o'clock for our panel discussion. And India, so Sarah, can you tell us a little bit what we have been doing on Kraft Summer? Good day, everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm responsible for the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in India, which is a umbrella organization for all the Swedish companies established in, in India. And right now there's about 200 companies. Uh, we've seen half of them have actually come in the last decade, in the last 20 years. So there's a great interest from Sweden to work towards work with India, also from, from a business perspective. Uh, when we ask our companies of how many women work within your organizations, uh, we know what we hear that it differs a lot. Of course, it, also, it depends a lot on which sector you're in. Uh, but on an average, uh, one out of five employees is a woman, as it is. However, when we looked at it, we, because we did a study last year amongst all the companies, and we saw that out of the 12,000 new employees that entered the Swedish companies during the year, 75% uh, of those, three out of four, was a woman. So hopefully, what we see is that it is increasing because it is something that Swedish companies have on their agenda. Uh, some companies take it uh, very serious and some uh, find it maybe hard, it depends on the sector. So say for example like IKEA, that uh, is just established itself in India, they have a very strong policy of 50-50 uh, on all levels, all departments. And they say it's non-negotiable. And I think that's the key point. When we look at gender equality, when we look at gender balance, we have to say it's a non-negotiable. It is not something we can say because of safety measures or because of this or because of that, uh, that we can uh, uh, not work for it to happen. We have to say it's a non-negotiable because in the end, men and women have equal value. We're not saying men and women should do the same things. We're saying that men and women have equal value, whoever they are or wherever they are. We do recognize that when it comes to discrimination and so forth, it's not only gender related. And we do work in a way that we work in a sector that is privileged uh, and, and uh, the socio-economic higher up standard, the socio-economic uh, standard, and we have to be aware of that. So therefore, we are also very humble when we start to say we want to work in gender equality because uh, recognize it's not only about gender but many other factors as well. So what we've done together with the Council of Gender and our company members is to start this program in Hatsana. So the league has said uh, it uh, means join your forces, where we wanted the companies in different lo locations where they are located in India to come together to thresh out, discuss and work and learn from one another uh, how they can further gender equality in which of the opportunities within their organizations and also within their communities and neighborhoods around them. So we've said that uh, for Kraft Sangha, everyone is welcome of all the companies to join in and become partners. And we said, be involved where you are. So uh, we have a big company cluster in Maharashtra, in Pune especially, with a lot of Swedish uh, industry manufacturing companies has been for many years. Um, and that's where we also started the first pilot project in Kraft Sangha last year. And uh, uh, we did a base study amongst the companies to find out how many women work there today and also what kind of work is going on uh, to promote gender equality, both within operations and also uh, in uh, to CSR. And uh, out of that, we defined four areas that we would like to work with that we want to address. And uh, one is the number of women uh, in industry number of women on, on, in the companies. So he said we want to start skilling women for non-traditional female roles. So since Pune is a very heavy industry, uh, companies uh, uh, with engineering, a lot of engineers, so forth. it's not traditionally a, a, a workplace for women. Uh, we started off with roles that are uh, for the industry, so forklift drivers, machinist operators. 
and uh, we've done two uh, batches of this now. So we start very slow, but we want to make, make sure we do this right. And it's quite interesting to see how uh, when we train the forklift drivers, I don't have the right statistic now, I think half of them were employed, all of them are employed uh, in different organizations now in, in Pune, and it's a great demand actually. And uh, many, several companies, including IKEA, say, oh, it's uh, actually we prefer the email for few drivers safer and less mistakes. But um, one thing is to skip women then from the workforce. We work together with the UN, uh, UNDP, and this in order to recruit women from the uh, communities around. Um, so that is under the CSR program. Another thing we're doing, we've started off is to see how then do we work within our organizations, uh, address biases, address leadership questions, address uh, safety, security, and so forth in, on all levels. And uh, I think we, the companies have a great opportunity to learn from one another, uh, in that from different sectors. We have software IT companies participating, we have retail companies, we have indeed, um, manufacturing companies. Uh, they're talking out to one another and take inspiration. The third thing we want to work with, we haven't really kicked off yet, but is to see how can we further in working creative, sustainable uh, value chains around us, where the companies can be a driver because they have a demand. And I'm not, we're not doing this, but one thought we have, or thinking about, say, for example, you, um, all factories around the Pune area, all of them have a canteen. They need food, they need vegetables in order to serve food. Can we work with the farming community around Pune to make organic, make sure that we produce and deliver organic vegetables and fruits to the canteen to a greater than a value chain that is actually sustainable by itself in many different ways. And that driven by the men as much as possible. And then the fourth thing is to see how we talk about code of conduct within our value chains. And within Within the retail sector, text that for sure, where there's a lot of women, there's already that factor of how do you work with, because there's so many women working there, so that's part of the code of conduct that many of the retail companies will work with their suppliers, making sure that there are um, equal salaries and their security and safety and so forth. But in the in heavy industry and so forth, gender equality is not necessarily part of the code of conduct when you talk to your suppliers. Quality is there, safety is there. Uh, environment and so forth, but we want to also see how can gender be one of the key factors within your uh, code of conduct and when you work throughout your value chain. So those are some of the things we are talking about and wanting to do, so please be aware we don't do them yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think uh, it, is, it is a slow process, it has to be because actually change doesn't start with us changing something up, it change, change starts with us changing something in ourselves. Um, and how we think about this. And I'm, I'm very humble uh, you know, about the fact that, that we are from a privileged um, sector and we have to uh, be aware of that, how we work with men and women on different levels and different places. Conversation with Urvika, which was on doing something together, and um, thank you, Yonan, for taking some brilliant pictures on such an important uh, topic. And thank you a lot to Kala Kora who gave us this opportunity because they work on art and for them to recognize this as a piece of art and such an important conversation we all need to have even in India. Thank you, thank you everyone at Kala Kora for giving us this opportunity. I think also we have a small part which is going to come later on after the panel discussion which is a film. So we are going to be showcasing a film and we struggled so hard to find a Hindi film which will have a dad shown as a role model or somebody who takes equal share in parenting. So we are showing a movie which is dealing with gender and bringing up your girls. But unfortunately, we still, I don't think we have any film in India, in Bollywood, which talks about dads as a role model. So we'll be showing a film called The Bomb, which was made by Ramin <laughs> Um And yes, uh, Shri Devi, as we all know, it's almost a year since she left us. She is the protagonist in that film. And she fights for her daughter who is gang um, There's a lot of conversation around that which has happened since Nirbhaya actually happened. But a lot of, a very few people in media have actually come out and made something which will evoke those feelings to, feelings for us as bystanders to make a change in our life, to make places safe for women. So uh, that's how we're going to be wrapping up the day today. And uh, it was important that we tell you
video about that. So please stay back for the panel discussion and come back and watch the movie. Thank you. If it would be mothers in the picture, because that wouldn't be something which is no. a debate, something we take for granted. And this is just to provoke in a certain sense, it's starting this debate about why we see these men so special. And it is a situation where you usually see women. But if I would take a picture of men and women, mothers and father at the same time, that would be wrong because these men have been at home on their own, taking full responsibility of the household and the children's upbringing. So, they, meanwhile, they are at home. The women, in this case, are uh, bringing in the money. She is the predator. So it would be wrong to have the women in the picture. That's a really good question as well. So if you have a young woman and a young man, young man who are both graduates, who would be most likely to get the one who gave the job? In most of the cases, it's the man. So before I started the work, I knew at Red Dot Foundation, I was in the aviation sector for close to 20 years. And I headed the department. And every time I had a vacancy, I would get only male CVs. It was till I asked the HR department, why are we not getting any female uh, CVs? And they said, well, there's no suitable profile. And I said, well, I don't go by education necessarily, I go by aptitude. So till you find me relevant female CVs, I will not close the position. And because I insisted, I ended up with over 33%, though I did not have that quota number in my head. And they told me that you are the only HOD head of department who insists. So I do believe somebody on the panel will say that it starts with us. We have to look at the ways we can break these stereotypes and change the system. If we don't do that, you will have women who are working but not earning, you will have men who have you know, degrees and no jobs. I think if we all contribute in our own way, and women are said to be more entrepreneurial in nature, and you know this country needs a focus on small businesses, we can increase our income and we can bring prosperity to our larger society. So that's where I would think uh, we need to uh, One more question. Why we sort of welcome this Maternity Leave Act from 2017? I mean, that was a move in the right direction, that the women would not lose their job just because they got pregnant. But and we can see that the retention has increased. But still, if the onus is only on the employer to pay for the maternity leave, and there's no government subsidy on it, of course, an employer will think twice about employing a female before employing a man. So I think uh, that is part of the equation here. And we have to move on. We have a man at the end to decide how they want to share these 480 days. But the legislature felt that we needed to fall for paternity leave because there were a lot of men who wanted but who didn't dare to ask their employers. So to create the right legally to actually, to, to actually have it. And then to give it a, an additional push, we first elaborated around bonuses uh, and then we came to the conclusion that the bonus system was not really working. So we went for the mandatory three months. Uh, and that's, but this is you know, a process. It's a process. And, and I think you want pictures really very beautifully describes how this process is taking place back home right now. But as you also pointed out, it's only 14% of the men who actually dare to take a very up to six months. So, you know, we still have work to do, clearly. Uh, in terms of working on gender identity with children, we have started already working in the crash 
right now. So there is a, a lot of uh, tests being done about how to break the, the sort of gender identity barriers so that girls don't necessarily play with you know, dolls and boys with cars. So there is, there is a very strategic move within the, both the, the sort of pre-school system and in the school system to try to, you know, get a, a paradigm of the children that is completely gender equal. But again, I think every society needs to formulate exactly what strategies to adopt. Because I can, I mean, I've been in India, I've seen certain things and I realize that your conversation probably needs to start somewhere else than where our conversation is. We began. That's horrible um, all over the world. Uh, in fact, that's something that goes on. But I, I will address that in a way to the gentleman in the back and his observation about the men and the, uh, the uh, picture that it's about masculinity that has to be changed as well. That if we could consider this, the caring father and the one who can express emotion and feel for someone else in terms of relationship, I think that we could come a long way in breaking that wall of who is a man and who is a woman. Uh, if we could change that, that would help, even though the problem would still be there. I think one of the points we have been trying to make, because of course, as, as a guest in India, I'm, I'm very surprised to see some of the statistics. Uh, but clearly, I mean, we have tried to move on three R's, to sort of move a woman from being an object to becoming a subject. So it's of course right, representation and resources, and Elsa already touched on the financial independence that comes with resources and sort of you being able to claim your rights differently. And of course, if you have a say through representation, you are in a better place. And if you have your rights, which you have to claim all the time, uh, and we can start with the human rights, but there are of course specific <coughs> rights for women, as we all know. Uh, then I think with that kind of equation and sort of feedback, because of course you need to learn and re-feed re into the cycle, there is a process that can start. But uh, I mean, this is how we have done our journey. And of course we offer, we're happy to share our experiences. Uh, but we also realize that, as I said before, I believe India needs to have its own conversation around this issue.